Welcome back, everybody. Time to grab your board and paddle out into the sea of ideas. See if we can catch that sales pipeline curling up over the horizon with our our key uh, our, our key surf master, Matt Hines. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Sales Pipeline. Thanks so much for joining us again. If you're joining us live on the Funnel Media Radio Network, thanks so much for everyone joining us during the workday. We are here every week, Thursday at 1130 Pacific, 230 Eastern. If you're joining us on the podcast, thanks so much for joining us. I think we're up over 40,000 subscribers now on the podcast. So very excited to have all of you joining us and very humbled by all of you that are joining us on a regular basis. And every episode of Sales Pipeline Radio, past, present, and future is always available at salespipelineradio.com. Each week, we are featuring some of the best and brightest minds in sales and marketing. Today is absolutely no different. I am I am beyond excited and humbled to have joining us today, Jeffrey Gittimer. He is the king of sales. Uh, if you're in sales, it is, he is a household name. He literally wrote The Little Red Book of Selling and has published a number of different books and is the author of the recently published, in fact, published last week, came out, Truthful Living, The First Writings of Napoleon Hill. Jeffrey, thanks so much for joining us today. It's a doggone pleasure. If you want some humor, you could say we've had the best minds of sales ever. We couldn't find any of them today, so we have Jeffrey Gittimer on the show. He's He's self-deprecating, as always. Yeah, I love (laughs) self-deprecating. I must also say, now that I know you're from Seattle, should we ever get together, we would go to Anthony's Pier 66 down in the uh, harbor, and we could fight over the check, and you could win. <laughs> I'd be happy to. The next time you're here, we'll definitely check that out. I mean, what's amazing is there are, you know, you go down by the waterfront and there are yeah. a, a ton of seafood restaurants, right? And and most of them are tourist seafood restaurants that any right. local would never bother to go into because it's fish for twice the price and it was caught like six weeks ago. But Anthony's is one of those retreats where it really is very good food, very fresh, very good. Not right on the waterfront, it's definitely a, a, a gem. Yeah, I'm downstairs, and I ordered the biggest Dungeness crab they have. And it's How big is that phenomenal. usually? A couple pounds. Okay. That's still pretty good size. Yeah, it is good size. Every you know, once the, in a while, they have a huge one. But My other tip for you and for anyone coming to Seattle, you know, you want to go and you want to watch them throw the fish, right? So you go to Pike's Market and that little spot yeah. where they throw the fish. And it actually is very, very fun. And that's all – it's all fresh fish. I mean, that stuff was all, like, you know, alive the yeah. day before kind of thing. But if you're looking however, at the fish, however, go down to – as you're looking at the fish group, go to the right, down the down the market, and the first fish place you come to on the left has better, cheaper fish. I was just going to say, like, you turn 45 degrees to your right, and there are two or three fish places there. They aren't nearly as busy, yeah. but that's where the locals go. Same thing, exactly. the price. Just got to know where you're going. Speaking of where we're begin, going, I want to begin the best upsell lesson I ever got, and it was at that place market. Okay. I'm walking through the market, and it was the summertime, and I said, I'm going to get some Rainier cherries and eat while we're walking around. So I go to this lady's. She, all she has is fruit. And I said, give me like a half a pound of, of Rainier cherries. And she puts them into a bag and weighs them, but the bag was kind of oversized. Mm-hmm. And she shows them to me and says, are you sure that's enough? <laughs> and I said, ah, all right, give me a pound. Give me a pound. And she does the same damn thing. She looks at it, and then she looks at me and shows me the bag. And she goes, are you sure that's enough? I said, all right, give me two pounds. So she gets me from a half a pound to two pounds, right? And I'm walking down the aisle, and I thought, I wonder if she does that to everybody. So I run back to the booth, and I go, tell me about the deal here that you just did on me. Do you do that to everybody? She goes, oh, yeah. <laughs> everybody who comes to that place gets, are you sure that's enough? How <laughs> simple could that upsell be? Are you sure that's enough? Five words. And with that, she got a $4 sale to a $16 sale. So now tell me that. You understand the difference between doing that and then if you go to a bar and they say, you know, kind of make it a double for a dollar more. I think there's a psychological difference between the two. Oh, yeah, without a doubt, because this woman is actively involved. She's showing you what you bought. Yeah. I mean, it is it is a sideshow to the way <laughs> she did it. I was so impressed I wrote about it. And I use that as a lesson in upselling that most salespeople – don't upsell enough. They have no concept of asking for more. My father taught me the philosophy in 1974 of upselling. He said, son, when their wallet's open, empty it. Oh, cool, Pop. Okay, well, there's a psychological that. difference between saying, would you like more, and is are you sure that's enough? Oh, well, that's <laughs> very different. Yep. She's challenging me to think 
of the answer myself. When you go to a 7-Eleven, the guy says, is there anything else? Like, no, there's nothing else. I want a house and a car. <laughs> you know, right. but if he said, "Are you, did you get a popsicle? Did you get a candy bar? Did you get a bottle of water? At least the suggestion would make me think about, is there something else? Is part of that based on the fact that when you're ordering the chariot, you don't actually know how much is enough. You don't actually know how hungry am I, how much is a half a pound. Yeah. And I thought the half a pound there to walking be around. I'm just walking around the market. A half a pound should do it. Yeah. But she put it in an oversized bag. That's the key. It's it looked like there was n- nothing freaking in there. So the challenge that you have is, as a salesperson, is your language conducive to buying? Not mm-hmm. selling. Is your language conducive to buying? When she said, are you sure that's enough? That made me give the answer. Because she could have said, this doesn't look like enough. You need more. Right. Right. Going, no, that's enough. I, I got enough. I got yeah. what I need. You know, it's funny. I, I actually wrote about that this morning on LinkedIn. So, you know, we got a lot of comp- companies as we're recording this. It's beginning of November. Companies are, believe it or not, starting to think about New Year and sales kickoff. Oh, yeah. One of my pet peeves of sales kickoffs is the content usually focuses on the product you want to sell and the sales process you want to follow. And very little time is devoted to the customer, like how they buy, like how they think, what their psychology is. I mean, don't ask them what keeps them up at night. Tell them what should be keeping them up at night and see where that goes. It's a different way. Or at least show them what the opportunity is that, and just in case they are, what keeps me up at night is none of your business. (laughs) Right. And, Suppose I answered wild sex. What would you say then? Well, that's why you don't want to leave those open-ended questions that can take you way Bingo. far away from where you want to go. <laughs> Bingo. But yeah. the, and it's a manipulative question anyway. It's true. I don't like that question. What it shows me is you've done no research on me and you're fishing. Right. I don't like fish questions. I don't like Miss America questions. I want something that's pointed. I was looking at your website yesterday, and there's a couple things I don't quite understand. I was wondering if you could help me. Mm-hmm. Sure, I can help you. I'm an expert at my website. Right. And that's where I need to go other than what what keeps you up at night. It's a bullshit question. We are blessed anyway, today to have with the, the king of sales, Jeffrey Gittimer, who if you've been in sales, hell, if you've been in marketing, you know this guy. You've read, you read his books. is sitting on your shelf somewhere. And Jeffrey, I do want to make sure we spend time talking about the new book as well, Fruitful Living, the first writings in Napoleon Hill, just published. We were talking before we started recording about Napoleon Hill and Think and Grow Rich, which I read a long time ago. I should probably go back and read it again. There are certain fundamental books that aren't really about sales and about marketing, but just help you be a better person, help you have a better outlook on life. And for me, Think and Grow Rich was one of those. Talk a little bit about it sounds like that book was impactful for you in your life and career as well. It was. In 1972, when I read Think and Grow Rich, I was with a bunch of other sales guys, and we did a, a four-hour morning training every morning for a year. And in that morning training, each person did a book report on one of the chapters from Think and Grow Rich. And there's only 15 chapters in the book, so... We were going through the book every three weeks. That year allowed me to do it ten times how many times I actually read the book. And that gave me my positive attitude. Well, fast forward several decades, and I became friendly with the guy that runs the Napoleon Hill Institute. And I said, hey, let me give something back to you guys. I'll I'll do your weekly email newsletter on one condition. The guy goes, what's that? I said, did you never pay me a nickel? And he goes, uh... Okay. <laughs> now, how do you say no to that? So I've been doing that for 15 years. And a couple of years ago, they found the original writings of Napoleon Hill 20 years before Think and Grow Rich. It was hidden in a course called Truthful Advertising, where Napoleon Hill was teaching kids how to sell ads. And after each one of the sales lessons, he wrote an After the Hill lesson with Mr. Hill, and he wrote it on positive attitude and personal development, and that was the foundation for writing Think and Grow Rich. So I discarded or I edited out all the sales stuff, and I kept in all the personal development stuff, and that's what created Truthful Living. And it's amazing. amazing. It's totally amazing. Chapter one, just as an example, he starts out and says, success is up to you. Oh, yeah, you're right. And chapter two is finish what you start. And chapter three is how to think. And chapter four is imagination. I mean, these are fundamental pieces But there's a secret inside of them, and I'm going to share with you what the secret is. He takes four or five different words and puts them together. And the secret is making certain that you use them all in conjunction with one another, not just by themselves. Mm -hmm. So, for example, he says, imagination, desire, enthusiasm, 
self-confidence, and concentration are the five most important words in the English language. Now, think about that. He's not saying imagination by itself, because if you have imagination and you have no desire or you have no self-confidence, you're going to keep it to yourself. And then the glue in the five words is concentration, focus. Think about concentration. This was written in 1917. There were no paved roads. There was no, there was no anything. A phone was like a rare commodity, and you had to go through an operator to make a phone call. There was no television. It was hardly a radio. Think about what there were no distractions, and yet Hill understood that concentration was the most important element in keeping your single purpose together. Today. Your phone dings more than it rings. You get notifications that your old high school boyfriend got fat, or you get notifications that you got a text or an email. It disrupts you. It takes you off your course. This is about how to find your focus, how to have your chief goal, how to maintain self-confidence, desire, enthusiasm, and imagination. And there are 23 other lessons in this book that will do exactly the same thing. It's it's an unbelievable book. We do a lot of work with inside sales teams, helping them Mm -hmm. improve efficiency and effectiveness. The underpinning of a lot of it is process and discipline, to be able to Mm -hmm. stay focused. And someone asked me the other day, like, how do you build a process that's going to really sort of drive predictability and ensure that that's happening across the sales team? And and my answer was, I, I can't. Unless I actually have robots doing this work, the people doing the work have to dedicate themselves to that purposeful work. They have to dedicate themselves to the concentration and focus to get this work done. I, I would imagine I there's a lot more people that, that believe in this, that listen to this and would nod, nod and say, yeah, that all makes sense, but will go back to the dings and the pings of their phone and, and, and ping exactly. pong across fire drills all day. Exactly. If your attitude sucks, you can't do a job right. And you're not going to even learn anything because you're going to close your mind to it. Yeah. And Hill is just saying, hey, dude, open up your mind, recognize that it's up to you, recognize that shit's going to happen to you that's not good, but those are blessings in disguise. And if you just finish what you start, you're going to win. Most people don't finish what they start. Most people quit way before it's time to quit because they either needed the money or they had a, got fired from their job or quit their job or whatever it was that they did, they stopped doing what was leading them to success before they got there. Unbelievable to me. And it seems so, to me that this, I mean, before you publish this book, I mean, I look at some of the stuff you published in the past, including your little gold book of Yes Attitude. I mean, clearly this, mm-hmm. this, uh, this approach has been with you for a long time. Oh, yeah. I recognize that you cannot be a great salesperson until you become a great person. Like that, the, those are the benchmarks. You can't become a great dad until you become a great person or a great mom until you become a great person or a great secretary until you become a great person. Whatever it is that you're looking to do, you have to be a person before you become an it. And attitude and belief are are some of the fundamentals in that process. Very few sales courses teach you about self-confidence. They're trying to teach you some technique that pisses other people off. Find the pain. What's your pain? The answer is none of your business. Mm-hmm. So stop trying to extract things out of me. Why don't you try to find the pleasure? Because if we both like Dungeness crabs or we both eat at Anthony's Pier 66, immediately we know a lot about one another. Right. And we're willing to talk about it even more. We're going to have to take a quick break here, pay some bills. We'll be right back more with Jeffrey Gittimer, the author of the new book, Truthful Living, the first writings of Napoleon Hill. We'll talk more about the book, talk about his podcast, talk a little bit more to, where to eat when you're coming to Seattle. We'll be right back with oh. Pipeline Radio. <laughs> Are you tired of sending emails and wondering if they're ever even open? If so, you need MailTag. MailTag is a Chrome browser extension for your Gmail that allows you to track your emails in real time. You receive alerts right on your desktop right away as soon as your emails are read. And as a special thank you for being a listener to this show, we've teamed up with MailTag to provide you guys with a special discount. If you simply use the word Heinz, in their promo codes, you can get 50% off for life. That's right. Heinz, H-E-I-N-Z, gets you 50% off for life. Or if you want to try it first, simply go to mailtag.io to start a completely free 14-day trial, no credit card required. What do you got to lose? Mailtag.io. Try it. You got nothing to lose except wondering if your emails have even been read. (laughs) Mailtag.io. 
The way we do business is advancing faster than ever before. Yet amongst the disruptions, there's one pillar that stays standing through it all. The power of a relationship. Relationships are at the core of everything. So how are today's organizations developing, nurturing, and leveraging them to drive success? Download the new research report on the state of relationship marketing and learn how your team can bridge the gaps between relationships and revenue. Download your free report at HeinzMarketing.com. That's H-E-I-N-Z Marketing.com. All right, let's pick it back up with Matt and his guest. Welcome back to Sales Pipeline Radio. I want to thank again our sponsor for this episode, uh, MailTag.io. If you are using Gmail and you want to have a very simple but effective tool to track when your prospects are clicking and uh, accessing your email and you want to be able to access that into your CRM and do that without a lot of bells and whistles but do it very quickly, easily, and with a quick Chrome extension in Gmail, I want to thank the folks at MailTag.io. If you go to MailTag.io and you use the coupon code HEINZ, H-E-I-N-Z, you will get half off their product for life. So thanks to the team there for a bottle of ketchup. And you get a bottle of ketchup. It's such a big deal. I will throw it in. Did you know Jeffrey, uh, speaking of Jeffrey Gittimer today, he's the king of sales, author of numerous books, including the new book, Truthful Living. This probably isn't going to surprise you now. Uh, when I was in fifth grade, I ran for student body treasurer of my elementary school, and my campaign slogan was 57 varieties of honesty. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, so that's I have totally cool. I have absolutely no connection that I know of to the actual Heinz Condiment Company, but I've milked it for as much as I can throughout my career. Hell yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you something. They were one of the World's Fair sponsors in 1939. Mm-hmm. You should look up the brochure because you can <laughs> buy them for five or six bucks a pop. Yeah. They're beautiful. Really? Oh, That's yeah. Cool. Just take a look. It might be something in there that you can use. That's fine. My wife is a teacher, and her maiden name is McDonald. And I remember you know, one of her students, when she told people she was getting married and what her name would be next year, they said, well, that makes sense. you got ketchup and hamburgers running together. That's it. <laughs> I don't know what your business card is, but if it doesn't look like the label on a ketchup bottle, something's drastically wrong with you. Well, it's funny you bring that up because inadvertently, and I, and I promise this was inadvertent, but like from the very beginning, our primary color on our website and our logo has been red. And cool. we redesigned our logo a, a few years ago. The intention was to make it sort of be kind of a fancy looking funnel. But like I have, I'm wearing it right now. I have a sweatshirt with our logo on it, and when I wear it on a plane, it looks like a squiggle of ketchup. It just, I mean, it just looks like ketchup. So people assume that it's from the ketchup people, and maybe that was also oh, cool. little. I don't know. Tell well, me, hey, I want to label is so recognizable. I appreciate you joining the show again today, and you know, we've been talking about the new book, Truthful Living: The First Writings of Napoleon Hill. You can find it on Amazon, or where all fine books are sold: hardcover, Kindle, audio book. And um, yeah. I, I love it because I mean, like, this is what I love about what you've done here is you've taken some of this sort of these, this universal sort of lessons that, that we've had been passed down from Napoleon, some of the early work that he's done uh, well mm-hmm. before books like Think and Grow Rich and others were published. You talked a little bit about where this has come from. And talk a little bit about some of the other stuff you're working on these days, because I know you've got other books in the, in the process. You're, you're constantly around the, around the world speaking. I've been checking out your new podcast. Uh, I don't know, maybe it's not new now. It's about a year old, and we're at about, uh, I think this month we passed 100,000 downloads. Wow. Which is pretty, I know, it's pretty amazing. That's People pretty good. love the podcast that we call our listeners diehards. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, of course, have the little band, you know, the wrist band that says sell or die. Yeah. And it defines sales. You sell or you're dead. There's no second yeah. place in sales. This is true. You didn't almost true. win a deal. You got to nothing. <laughs> and those are the, the elements. What has been your, your sort of approach to content diversity because i mean you've got a blog you've got the podcast you've got the book i assume it's been fairly intentional to diversify the channels to get your message out yes there's no one channel that brings me my business although i will tell you a lot of it now comes from my social channels mm-hmm. you know i most people will brag about the fact that they got 1800 connections on linkedin i have 28000 connections on linkedin and a hundred and some thousand followers on twitter and 5 million views on my youtube channel the phone rings and someone will say, either I read the Little Red Book of Selling, or I read the Sales Bible, or I read the Gold Book of Yes Attitude, or I follow you on Twitter, I follow you on LinkedIn, I listen to your podcast. You can't just have one thing. You have to have enough diversity so that when someone Googles, hey, I need somebody who's an expert in sales, 
your name pops up. Right. And if it doesn't, it's because you haven't posted enough about your expertise. And I don't want to say this as a brag. I just want to say this as a fact. I've delivered about 2,500 corporate seminars over the last 23 years. I've never made a phone call. Hmm. Everybody calls and wants to buy. People don't like to be sold, but they love to buy. I own that trademark phrase. And that's the challenge that you're facing in the marketplace. Who knows you? It's in sales, it's not who you know. In sales, it's who knows you. And that's the way it works in this. You know, you already you knew who I was before we ever talked on the phone. Absolutely. You, you probably have one of my books or two, and you probably violate my copyright law when you go out and do training. Fine. <laughs> you know, I want to ask you a question about that. I think about some of the stuff that you've written. I mean, the Little Red Book is selling. I don't know very many sales leaders that don't have that in their library, right? And so Correct. Once, you, once you've read something and once, once it's become – you read something and you believe in it, it becomes part of who you are, you start using that language. How do you think about that from the idea of sort of maintaining control of your IP and your language with – allowing it to become part of the nomenclature of sales, which really ends up driving more business to that you, I assume. I trademark things, I copyright things, and still people take liberties. Mm -hmm. I can't control that. But if you look at any one of my books, you'll see that if there's a full-page quote, you'll also see my name at the bottom of it. So I don't let people simply copy my stuff without seeing my name. And very, it's very important, if you look up the Little Red Book of Selling, if you just open up the book, if they copy a page, it doesn't just say the title. It says the title and my name, every single page. And it's designed specifically that way because I know people are going to take liberties. I know somebody's going to say, here's how you network. Here's how you ask questions. Here's, here's how you close deals. Here's how you get leads. I'm okay with that as long as they say my name. And I've become known synonymously, literally, I'm the king of sales because I named myself. <laughs> Nobody else took the title, so the hell with it. I took it. And if someone thinks they're good enough, challenge me. I'll, yeah. I'll step down. But this, he, these are the rules of challenge. Ready? Yep. We both do a seminar in front of a 1,000 people, same day. We each put 50000 bucks in cash at the end of the stage. And at the end of the hour, the audience votes, winner take all. And somebody else could become the king of sales. All they got to do is beat me. Right. Simple, right? Pretty simple. So have your listeners do. phone in. If they, if they, if they want to take the, my challenge, then, uh, you know, I'm happy to do it. I would love to do it. It's a good lesson that words are one thing. Words you put on a page are one thing, but it's, yeah, yeah. it's your ability to execute oh, on yeah. that really the differentiator. we got just a couple more minutes here with Jeffrey Gittimer, the uh, king I'm of the Let me give the secret. Let me give the secret. The do reason it. I'm as good as I am is I'm a student of what I do every day. And I love what I do every day. And if you don't love what you do, you can never rise to the to the greatness that you're hoping for. What you have to have that. the passion. Absolutely. That's how ball players they go to the to the Hall of Fame or they go to the All Star Game. They want to be the best, and they're the most passionate about it. Jeffrey, I want to ask you a personal question as we run out of time here, and I'm going to ask it to you only because it's in your bio. So I'm hoping that it's going to be all right. You say in your bio that you say my name is Jeffrey Gittimer. I'm a salesman. I'm a dad. I'm a college dropout. And I want to ask you about the middle one because you talk about in your bio your, your, your daughters and you say they taught you patience. I would love to hear how your approach to selling and whether patience has become a part of your sales approach in, from what your daughters have taught you as well. I have four daughters and four granddaughters. Wow. And a fiance and two female dogs. I have all girls all the time. <laughs> and you can't yell at girls because they're no. girls. You have to have the patience to say, my patience was tried as, a, as an early father. When the kids would do something wrong, I had two choices. I could yell at them or I could question them. And I chose questioning, and this is it was very simple. I go, wow, how did that happen? And they go, well, we did that. Do you think that was the best thing you could have done? And they go, well, no. I said, what do you think you could have done that would have made the outcome a little different? And they go, well, we could have done this, this. I said, well, do you think you could do that next time? And they go, yeah. I said, well, let's do that. And done. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that we as parents have zero patience. You know, you you have an iPhone or some reasonable facsimile that doesn't work as well. And you call coast to coast. You call me from Seattle to Charlotte. And the, the call takes three seconds to go through. And you're tapping the phone like, why is it taking so long? <laughs> like, no, no. How does it know? How does it yeah. know what to do? It's like a miracle. Okay. Yeah. 
we as a society have no patience. Domino's Pizza, we deliver it in 30 minutes or it's free. Everybody wants it now. Everybody wants it for nothing. And growing up in that society, you have to have the patience and the structure to be able to perform in that environment. Right. And I have learned it by being a dad. Love it. Hey, we are unfortunately out of time. They gave us, they only give us a half hour here, Jeff. Yeah, now we could, so uh, I can continue. For a while. I can keep going. We didn't really get back to good food in Seattle, but uh, we'll have to do this again sometime. For those of you listening, if you want to learn more about Jeffrey, you can check him out. We well, can check all of his books out, quite frankly, at Amazon. It's his new book, Truthful Living, The First Writings of Napoleon Hill. And to learn more about you, I mean, I know you've got tons of content, your podcast. Where should people check you out directly? Well, in the show notes, which I'm sure you're going to put in there, um, just put the Amazon link to Truthful Living or the link to Gittimer.com or GittimerLearningAcademy.com, and that, that, uh, that would make me the happiest guy on the planet. Last question for you, 2019 yeah. prediction for the Phillies. The Phillies will be able to hit the ball out of the infield on the fly <laughs> for the first half of the year like they normally do, and then they will die. All right. uh, this year we made it all the way to September before we died. That was good. Yeah. Hey, as a, as a lifelong wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. Yeah. But the Eagles, the Eagles oh. will kick the Seahawks' ass into the dirt where they belong because I hate the Seahawks and their coach. Who are, just for some reason, I just don't like the guy. It was the only time I ever wanted New England to win a game, and they, <laughs> you lost on the dumbest call of a play in the history of sports. It's the first early. goal, Marshawn Lynch, and you pass the ball. It's still too soon to talk about that. That's just, it's it's still painful. Yeah, I apologize. But <laughs> what's the dumbest play in the history of sports? Any argument with that? I, well, yes, in hindsight. Oh, Although, if it would have worked, we would have called them a genius. Oh, my God. It would Come on. Marshawn Lynch quit the team after that. He did. What did you know? I don't know if you know. Now we're way over time. You, you know, the, uh, the Raiders did it to him earlier this season again. And you notice he's not playing again. They're idiots. Yeah, I know. Well, we could, I could, I could give you many reasons why the Raiders are idiots, but we're out of time for that for sure. Hey, thanks very much for joining us on Sales Pipeline Radio. We will be back here next week at 11.30 Pacific, 2.30 Eastern for more great guests. On behalf of Jeffrey and my great producer, Paul, thanks for joining us. This is Matt Hines Thank on you. Sales Pipeline Radio. You've been learning football and learning about sales pipelines right here. And the Funnel Radio Channel, brought to you by the good folks at Heinz Marketing.